Hello, this is Barry Griffiths from Wrestling With Real Estate. And today I'm so excited to be on Scott Carson's show, the No Closers show. Today we're going to be talking about how to have a plan B and why a plan B is important, right? I found out the hard way. Don't be like me, be smarter, listen to the show and learn how to have a plan B. And this is amazing. Scott is the man and I'm going to choke slam you if you don't listen. Ah! This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closure Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited to be here with you today. And I'm really jacked up. I'm all hyped up, baby, for our <laughs> special guest today on the Note Closure Show. Now, you may have seen him. You may recognize him. Not only is he is massively good looking, he's just a beast. He's got a huge passion for real estate, but you may not recognize him. Now, you may see him, recognize him from a different type of Monday night show that he's appeared on in the past and being a bit of a celebrity out there. This guy uh, likes to take real estate from the top road or from the turnbuckle. Uh, he's previous. Uh, you may have seen him on uh, the Wrestling with Real Estate podcast and YouTube channel, but this guy got his start in, in the ring, in the wrestling ring, ladies and gentlemen. He wrestled the likes of uh, John Cena, been on Monday Night Raw before, and I'm really honored to have our buddy uh, Barry Griffiths join us here on the Note Closure Show today. What's going on, Barry? How you doing, man? What's up, Scott? My goodness, that was quite the intro, man. I'm blushing over here. I don't know what to say. That's a lot, that's a lot to live up to, man. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so people probably think, okay, how the heck did you go from wrestling into real estate? And so I've got some questions, but I guarantee that's the first kind of burning question our listeners desire there. Let's talk a little bit about how you got to being a real estate. Because most people think, oh, on Monday night, Ron wrestling John Cena. Dude, that's got to be some big stuff. You know, that's, that's that's celebrity status, right, baby? Yeah, well, I think that's the biggest misconception to start off with. People think because you're on TV that you're making millions. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't hurting for money and I wasn't poor by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, you're early on in your career like that. And, and depending where you are uh, on the show as well, you're not making millions. You're making good money, but you're not definitely not making millions. So I was wrestling on TV, like you mentioned, did some cool stuff, pay-per-views. John Cena, Randy Orton, Kane, those kind of people, wrestle those kind of people. Um, I made some okay money, but that didn't last for, for long. It lasted maybe four years. And I was really focused on wrestling. I, that's all I kind of knew, right? I didn't have a degree in anything. I didn't have like a backup arm. I'm from the UK, over here in the US. So in 2014, when WWE didn't renew my contract and I did not see it coming, I was like, oh, okay, uh, this is an interesting <laughs> situation. Like, I can pick up dumbbells and I can pick up people, but what else What else can I do, right? And I was trying to figure it out. And, and but the, there was a bigger problem than that. So, yes, I, my career had come to, not come to an end, but my dream had kind of come to an end. And I just bought a house. So this was in April of 2014. January of 2014, guess who went and bought a $430,000 home? <laughs> Mr. Mason Ryan, right? Uh, Mason Ryan went and bought a $434,000 home that had a massive mortgage, or it was massive for me. It was twenty five fifty a month at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, <laughs> it was quite a burden, right? Because you, I, I went from making good money, six figures, to now making nothing and trying to figure out where do I go from here? What do I, like, I'm 32 or 33, however, however old I was at the time, what do I go from here? So first thing I had to figure out was this monthly mortgage payment. And I just bought the house. So if I bought it in January and this is April, I'm going to sell it. If I sell it, I sell it at a loss. Plus I love the house, pure emotional buy. Like I like, like the layout, like the colors of the wall, like the kitchen, like, you know, like the neighborhood, like all the stuff that doesn't really add value to the property. So, but, but it's got a lot of that uh, intangible excitement because it, it's a nice looking house. Vegas was going through a huge boom. This was in Tampa. This was oh, in Tampa. Tampa. Oh my God. Tampa was still going through, really going through a huge boom. Okay. Tampa. Yeah. Now it makes sense. Okay. I was thinking Vegas, but no, that's Tampa. Wow. Yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, so but but really the house wasn't necessarily a good investment. Even if, I could have bought so many things back then that would have been an amazing investment, but it was like in a little bit of an area outside out of the way and blah blah blah. Anyway, all the anyway, so I got this huge monthly mortgage payment. I can't sell the house because I loved it, because it might I've lost my my job and my dream kind of. I can't sell the house because it was like mentally, it was too too much. I could have sold it and made a bit of a loss and just cut my losses and be like, all right, get out of here. But I just couldn't bring myself to do that. So I went down the rabbit hole of finding a tenant. How do you find a tenant? How do you screen a tenant? Um, you know, all this kind of stuff, how to be a landlord, all this stuff when I was trying to find a tenant. So I eventually found a tenant, put a tenant in there. And it started, I think that what started me down that rabbit hole of researching and I came across real estate. It was like, well, you can invest in real estate and you can like have this side gig. And because also I think I was looking for a plan B at the time because I didn't have a plan B, right? I was going to still wrestle and be in entertainment, but I needed something else that went, you know, side by side to that, you know, and real estate was a great thing for me to find to do that because you can kind of do both. I feel like depend, you know, you can do anything in real estate, right? But I found a way to kind of do both kept going through that, kept going through that and fell in love really with real estate and had a passion for it. And, you know, eventually got three single family homes and then sold them all and focusing on multifamily now. So. Well, I want to bring up a little bit of what, you know, that, that mindset, because I think such a parallel to so many people are, are struggling with right now, you know, mm -hmm. they've had that job or they've been laid off or their industry has been shut down, you know, especially in Florida or in Vegas, where you're at, you think about all the, the hospitality and the tourism, people up there owning houses and stuff like that. Now they're basically without a plan. I've heard you talk about on other podcasts about how your plan A, B, and C was all the same thing to win the heavyweight championship in wrestling, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of people have that, but when dreams get kind of knocked away, how long do you think, how, how, how long thinking back, did you kind of struggle with trying to figure out your direction? Was it six months? Was it a year? Was it a month? You know, I know now, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. I'll have you answer that question before I ask the next one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, honestly, I don't know. Cause honestly it was a bit of a, it wasn't the greatest time in my life if I'm completely honest, because no, because I worked so hard to be a wrestler. And I always, I, and the other thing was I identified as a wrestler. It's talking about a mindset thing, right? Mindset yeah. shift. I identified as a wrestler. Everybody knew back home. Everyone calls me Barry the wrestler. You know what I mean? Talk about identity, <laughs> you know? So then I was like, wait, well, wait, I'm not going to be a wrestler now and maybe anymore. And I've got to figure, figure out this whole financial situation. So it took me a while and it's probably took me, I knew immediately that I needed within about two or three weeks that I needed to rent out the place. So I kind of moved forward with that slowly and in a mental fog, but kind of, you know, within a month or two, I had the place rented out and moved nice. somewhere else. But it took me a little while longer to really let the cobwebs, you know, clear and kind of realize, wait a minute, I have this place rented, real estate, like this can work. I researched it, bigger pockets, then rich dad, poor dad. That kind of took a while. Now, I think the parallel is interesting, like you said, about to what people are going through now, because I think, like me, I think people have a W-2 job and they thought that was the guaranteed income for the next 30, 40 years, and then they can retire and then they're fine. And, you know, they go off and drink cocktails in the Dominican Republic like we like, <laughs> to, right? like, we, like, we like to do. But I think this year has been a, a real awakening for a lot of people, right? Unfortunately, right? In, in that this job that I thought that was guaranteed, right, in whatever whatever they're in, right, I thought it was going to work for the next 30 years, isn't guaranteed. It's something like the pandemic can come along. And I think, I don't know if there's been more real estate investing than ever, but there should be or people open to that, right, because it's just a plan B, right? Like we talked about, I was in entertainment, right? <laughs> Talk about uh, susceptible industry to get hit by anything, right? The, the entertainment industry, but it doesn't matter what you're in. You could be in a corporate job, right? Climbing that W-2 ladder, trying to get to 59 and a half so you can access your 401k and your IRA, right? Just, just to get to that point. But I think it's definitely been an awakening for people to realize like, wait, I'm not that secure. I, like, what is, where is my life heading, right? And I think real estate is such a good compliment to someone who has that awakening, right? Because it can be whatever you want it to be. We can talk about this, right? I invest in multifamily, you invest in notes, but both of those can be something that you do on the side. It doesn't need to be, hey, I'm spending 70, 80 hours a week doing real estate, managing tenants, blah, 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 right? You can do it on the side and it can be something that you can start with very little to almost no investment, right? I'm uh, um, out of pocket of your own money. You need someone's money. It just doesn't need to be your own. So I, yeah, I, uh, such a great point. And I think there is so many powers. And just to go one step further, when this happened, I obviously I work for Cirque du Soleil now. So March 9th, we haven't done a show since March 9th. And God knows when we're going to go back to work. 
But as opposed to the first time it happened with wrestling, where I was panicking, oh my God, what's going to happen? What am I going to do? This time I had a real calmness and a little bit of excitement actually that I could focus on real estate a little bit more and that I could really pursue real estate a little bit more. So that's what real estate can give you. It doesn't need to be your main hobby or your main force, um, um, job or whatever you focus, but it can be something you do on the side. Now, if you decide to go full, full, full time in it, great, but it can be something on the side that can give you that freedom and that, um, um, I don't know that that not having to worry about it, right? Yeah, peace of really mind that. comes to mind. You exactly, know, it's life. exactly that peace of mind. If you have a few pieces of real estate, or you've invested in some also, you've done whatever, you've invested in some syndications, whatever it may be, you have that income coming on, and you understand real estate. And I think that's also huge as well as people having that realization. Okay, I can do it. So say say someone loses their job, they're like, okay, real estate, and I can go for that. I can go to work in real estate and make more money and invest more money. Do that. That's something that's always going to be there, right? Real estate's not going anywhere, right? <laughs> Let's be honest. Technology is changing, but real estate's always going to be there. You know, that, that I, I love that. And you bring that up there. Most people, we deal with so many people that want to eventually leave their J-O-B, you know, leave their job because they want to do something. They want to have a different lifestyle. We talked about, you, you, you and I've talked before about how we enjoy hanging out in the Dominican or you know, drinking pina coladas or margaritas or whatever you're drinking down there, you just rum <laughs> something, right? But I, I want to ask you, do you think when you went through that, the, the trial and tribulation a few years back and figuring things out, do you think that your work ethic, and I want to throw this back out there because you, I've heard you mention before somewhere that your family owns a hundred plus year construction company. They were doing horse wheels or were also the undertaker. You worked as an undertaker for a little while, not the wrestler, the undertaker, <laughs> but you know, do you think that work ethic and going from that has is, is helped you kind of be export like, okay, I need it. I, you know, Ron, probably love the family. Probably, probably want to go back into the construction industry. Is that about right? Uh, yeah, well, I was involved in the construction. So I, my, my granddad built a triplex when I was a kid. And then my dad and his brother built a triplex. And I was around that. I was always around it. Yeah. But I, I didn't, I worked as a carpenter for a while, but I was, I always say this, the worst carpenter in the history of carpentry. Like the worst. I could barely... I, I couldn't saw straight. I could barely hit a nail in. I was just terrible because I, I had no interest. I just ended in it because I had, at the time, I didn't know what else to do. And I went, you know, you don't know what to do. Okay, go work for your dad, you know? And like, you feel like, I felt like I had to because family business has been helped. So I had that interest in it and I still enjoy the construction side of stuff. But I else doing it. I enjoy how it looks once it's finished. And I, I enjoy going on site and seeing, okay, fix this. We're going to do that. But in terms of actually myself, I, I don't like. So I think, but I always had that. And I think real estate for me as well is, is I'm a simple guy, right? <laughs> it's this, it, this, you know, there's complex to real estate, but essentially it's pretty simple, right? Residential rental real estate. You buy a building, you rent it out, you get that money, and then boom, you make the cash flow, right? That's the most simplistic way of looking at it. But it's not hard to describe. It's not stocks where you've got to understand the future values and like what the stock is doing now. And like, I looked into that and it blew my brains out. Like I was just like, I was like, well, I have no idea what this, but I can understand real estate. Now, I'm not saying it's that simple, but it's the concept is, and I love the concept. So definitely that, that played a part in it. I think, you know, that's a good point that I didn't really realize until recently that I think being around it all my, my life, I think I have that interest in it. Now I don't want to get my hands dirty, but I want to be involved in it. So yeah, I think that definitely played a part as well. You know, well, there was a, there was a work ethic as well. So your question was work ethic. Yeah, there was a work ethic, work ethic. I think that was involved. But again, real estate is really cool because you can work as much or as little as you want, right? And yeah. you can, you know, yeah, your success is somewhat going to reflect that. But at the same time, you know, I'm, if this is a podcast, I'm holding up my phone. There's so much you can do from your phone, right? So it's amazing. It's literally you can run your business from your phone almost. And it's just amazing. So yeah, there was a work ethic, but I think I'm kind of lazy too. That's why I like real estate because I want to create that financial freedom where, you know, I have money, property managers and people running. Well, it, I, I think it, there's a lot of similarities. You're flexing a different muscle now versus getting <laughs> you know, versus dumbbells and lifting people. You're flexing a different muscle and, and using that stuff. That, you know, you know. I, I want to kind of uh, take us back there because you're like, okay, I'm stressed out. I'm worried about where I'm at. Okay, I got my, I got this immediate kind of albatross taken care of. You know, I got a rent mm -hmm. on place. Okay, pretty cool. They're covering most of my, most of my mortgage or all of my mortgage for the most part. Let's talk about the transition to investor. What were some of the things that you, the actions you take to start finding information or 
educating yourself in, 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 as an investor and kind of those next steps for you. Yeah, and it took a while for me to go from renting that out to actually buying my first property simply because I was a, an independent wrestler at the time doing like a little bit of acting gigs and like all this kind of stuff. But I was like a, you know, um, just a self-employed guy, just, you know, one month I would make good money, then the next month I would make zero, like, you know, and it was all over the place. So investing was, and what I understood about investing at the time was that you needed a bank loan, you get 20% down, you know, just... Yep. Even though I understood real estate investing, I didn't. So I knew the concept at that time. I still didn't fully understand what was the options there. So it took a few years for me to get. I eventually got a job with Cirque du Soleil, which is you know pretty crazy. I moved out to Vegas. So now I've got a W two job um, where I'm going to you know guaranteed money, six figures. You know, I I, I and plus also I have that. Um, behind me right before like you know i didn't want to buy investment property and not have a guaranteed job that I, you know i was going to be making that money you know like wrestling like i said you know if i've got to make the mortgage payment one month and i don't make a penny well that's stressful so i didn't want to get in that situation so i moved to vegas i actually rented when i first got here i wish i bought i moved here in december of 15 i wish i'd have bought back then i would have made a kid <laughs> you know you live and you learn right but anyway i rented and then yeah sorry, I, I was sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, I was renting and, um, but I knew I wanted to invest. I knew I wanted to invest, but I just, at, at the time, I guess was a little scared to pull the trigger maybe a little bit. And also didn't know how long I was moving to Vegas, this new job, this new career. I didn't know how long it was going to last. Um, but I, you know, it was bigger pockets without a doubt that I got hooked on, you know, bigger pockets is a, is a, the new rich dad, poor dad, almost. I feel like I said the younger generation's rich dad, poor dad. And I rich, I read rich dad, poor dad too. And that was also like a, my head exploding moment i was like wait a liability and, and an asset are different and one pays you money and one costs you money it was like wow it was just like the light bulb went off massively so i was just diving into any podcast i could find on on real estate really and back then there wasn't as many as there right. are now the bigger pockets was the main one i was just listening to it every day on the way into work i was in work like just thinking about oh, okay, how do i buy a property how many do I need? And I figured 40 property. And I remember being at certain certain parts of the show and there's certain parts I'm really high up, like, I don't know, seven high up, hanging there, waiting to do my bit in the show. And I'm hanging. I remember so many times being in that spot thinking, right, I need 40 properties, right? So I make this much. This is how much I spend, right? How can I spend less? Okay, how much does my wife make? Okay, and this is our average medium home price. Just thinking about if I buy, because I wanted to, 10 years was my goal, 40 properties, that's four properties a year. Three, 20% down on one owner-occupied property, right? That's how I was thinking. I didn't understand anything, but that's how I was thinking. So I was trying to figure out roughly how much I needed. And I remember being up there and I was just like, not thinking about what, I maybe should have been thinking about what I was doing. <laughs> that's the thing I'm thinking like. <laughs> I was so consumed. I was so consumed by, you know, I was so obsessed with it. I was just so, so in love with this idea of that you could create this financial freedom and not just financial freedom, but like cool, a lot of good wealth for yourself and create the lifestyle for yourself. And I was just, remember just being, I was thinking about it all the time, listening to podcasts on the way home from work, like just like obsessed with it, reading anything I can talk, going to meetups, any meetup I could go, going to meetup, anyone who would shut up long enough to let me talk about it, I talk about it, you know, it's just, I just, it just, I just really fell in love and I'm still in love massively to this day with, with real estate. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's it, total immersion as best you can. I mean, that's, you know, those out there, they're looking to do it. That's, I totally agree. You're listening to podcasts, you're educating, you're turning your commute into a classroom. And then in your spare hours, you're attending networking events or events. And Vegas has, a, has some of the best, some of the largest real estate investment clubs in the country out there. It does some really good ones. Jason Burke's got a big one out there and a few others out there that are I'm friends with and spoken out there a couple of times too. So that's, that's, that's awesome. Now, were you looking to invest? I know I've heard the story here before. So I'm kind of, I'm tossing a softball here. You're investing in Vegas. <laughs> and you're like, it's kind like of expenses it. there a little bit. Where did you look to invest and, and kind of what was that transition? Cause I know you, you bought some stuff outside of your zip code there. And let's talk about that a little bit, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, so uh, just to give it, get everyone up to date. So I was thinking I need 40 single family properties, 10 years, right? And I was like, oh yeah, 10 years is an acceptable level. I was 36 or something at the time. So I can be like 45, 46 and retired or whatever. 10 year time horizon, right? Well, I, through going to meetups and talking to people on bigger pockets and stuff, I met this guy and I was having coffee with him. And I, it's funny because you remember certain things, right? There's t I met tons of other people, couldn't remember the conversation, but I remember exactly where he was sitting, where I was when I told him what my goal was, right? To buy 40 single family homes. And he told me like, hey, why don't you just buy an apartment complex? 
And I was like, wait, wait, can you explain that a little bit more? And he explained, obviously, you can get to one, buy one property and get to 40 doors and do that in one deal. Now, obviously, you need the money and it's not quite that easy, but like that concept makes sense. And then I understood all the other things about, you know, you can increase the value if you increase the rents, lower the expenses, you know, you have a lot more insulated to vacancies if you have a bigger property, blah, 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 right? All, all, all that good stuff. So I was like, then got hooked on multifamily, then dove into other podcasts about that, was hooked, was hooked, was hooked. And at this time I had three single family homes, that two in Vegas and one in Tampa. Um, and I decided, well, these have gone up a good amount in value. I want to be multifamily, let me sell. So I slowly sold off all three of those and had that cash. So, and I was looking in Vegas for multifamily, but at the time I thought Vegas was expensive. Now, looking back, I should have bought everything I looked at. We could have, it probably doubled, if not tripled, and that's in the next last three or four years. I wish I'd have bought every, everything I looked at that time or anything I could afford. But anyway, I, I didn't like, you know, Vegas is boom or bust town, right? It always has been. I think it always will be unless there's a lot of change here. But Vegas is so dependent on um, tourism, like leisure and tourism. It's like 27% of the job base here, I think, right? So... It just tells you everything there. So I didn't like that. So I was looking at different markets to, to invest. And I like the Midwest. I always heard the Midwest, good cash flow, mm-hmm. stable, blah, 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 blah. Well, in the meantime, I'd hired a coach. Uh, Joe Phillips was my mentor because I knew I, I knew I didn't know anything. <laughs> when I was looking at the properties in Vegas, I got close on a 20 unit one time. I was like, wait, 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 let me back up here. I don't have no idea what I'm doing. I literally have no clue what I'm doing. I've read and I'm trying to research, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Let me back up and try and um, get a coach and figure stuff out. So I found the Midwest and he said, and I would like the areas. And he said, Hey, why don't you look at Cincinnati? Looked at Cincinnati. Like the, there's a bit of job, job growth there, population growth. It's not massive. It's not, you know, Atlanta It's not Arizona. It's not um, Texas, but there is you know, population growth, there's job growth, there's good job diversity, they're um, very landlord flat friendly, yeah. there's a lot of people renting there, the percentage of renters there is pretty high, and there's a lot of the smaller multifamily stuff as well, 20 to 30, 40 units, and a little bit under as well, so there's a lot of that stuff as well, so it just made sense to me, and when I went there, I liked the city, so I ended up investing there, now I think maybe what you're asking is, how was I able to do that from Vegas, and investing there, was I built a team, and you hear yeah, everyone, um, don't think I'm repeating anything that's mind blowing to anyone here, but you build a team, right? And I guess that's the easy answer. But the, how do you build a team? I guess is a question from there. Some people might have. And for me, I started with one person. I think David Green on um, in his book, Long Distance Real Estate Investing, start start with one guy. Find one good guy. You can't just start a mediocre or crappy guy, right? Find one really good guy and get that connected with. Now that was a broker. I met a broker from Akers and Miller Chap, and he connected me with the other team members, and I just I vetted them. But I still better them. Now that team, you know, does so much for me, and I'm able to be in Las Vegas on my phone, or or on Zoom talking to Scott Carson about how I did it, and you know they do everything for me. Now I still go there every now and again, but I probably haven't been there in three or four months. And you know it's, we're doing extensive renovations, so they, you know people can send videos, um, pictures. You have other people that go and check up on them, you know, and it's. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So essentially, it's not scary. I was a little scared to start off, but I knew I, I knew I needed to do it as well because the Vegas market didn't make sense. So, and, and I say, if I did it, anyone could do it. I literally, I'm like, I was a wrestler. Come on, if I can do it, yeah, you can do it. You're all smarter than me. There's no doubt about it. But your first foray, was it a six unit? If I remember, I heard somewhere. Yeah, it's a six unit. Yeah, I wanted something a lot bigger, but it needed a lot of work. Like all the units were, were wrecked to be honest with you they all needed maybe not down to the studs but needed a lot of a lot of you know new kitchen new bathroom new flooring paint some reconfiguration on some of them i put washers and dryers into all of the units because that area can kind of support that so i've done five of the six i've got one um left to go that the guy's going to be moving out at the end of the month and finishing that one and then turning it hopefully you know fixing that up and then a whole six will be rented and i've taken rents from low 500s to an average of about i think average about 1200 nice <laughs> that's a pretty good value add you know and i've spent Very a good, good value add, yeah. i spent a good amount of money but just to give people an idea of numbers i bought it for 300 i'm gonna end up putting maybe about 100 in and i'm hoping it's going to be worth 650 700 maybe once it's all done so then 10 31 that into 40 or 50 units from there that's the plan and maybe do something similar maybe not quite as much um, such a heavy value add, but you know, that's the beauty of multifamily. I think you can 
keep 1031 into something bigger and bigger and keep growing like that. So that's well, that's that's hopefully the case if Biden keeps 1031. Yeah, in. yeah, yeah. Maybe I maybe need to hurry up with that and get this done pretty quickly before he takes or, or or maybe into a deferred sales trust uh, for a period of time too, to, which can save you from having to go up find a property immediately. And uh, I'm gonna put you in touch with a buddy of mine who does a lot of that for. Uh, apartment investors out there. So 1031 is a deferred sales trust and, and it allows for you to do some creative things with it as well. But that's, you know, you're, you're, you're buying there, buying in the Midwest. Now you finance that self-finance or you get a loan or private money or you did a syndication. What was kind of the financing process behind that? Barry? Yeah, I, I just got a, so that, that was an issue too. The financing wasn't just as easy because for one, I don't live there, right? So a lot of these, and it doesn't qualify because it was such a small loan as a 300 grand purchase doesn't qualify for Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, right? You need this, even the small balance loan, you need to be over a million dollar loan to qualify for that. So I didn't qualify for any of that agency debt. So, you know, I was trying to find and local, local credit unions or local banks, they want you to have a footprint. They want you to either live there, have a property there. So that was challenging. So I was calling around in the end, I got in touch with US Bank. And because there's a US bank here in Vegas, they were able to use that as I opened an account there is that I had a footprint there and they were willing to loan. So they're the ones that gave me a loan. They gave me a 80% uh, LTV. So 20% down. So, which wasn't bad, you know, for my first property, it was a small property. I think that helped me. Now, if I bought a $2 million property for my first one, maybe they would have wanted 70% LTV, right? You know, they would have changed that a little bit. And I got a 4.4% interest rate, which wasn't bad at the time. I think start of the year, this was January of, of 2020. Um, and also no prepayment penalty, which was huge because I knew I wanted to turn around, turn the property around and sell it or do a 1031, which is still selling it essentially. Um, I, I knew that I didn't want a prepayment penalty because that can really hurt you, right? For people who don't know, prepayment penalty is what the bank put on it or yield maintenance so that they still make their money, right? They still want to make their, you know, uh, profit on that loan. Because if you turn around and sell it pretty quickly, they don't get that chance to make that money. But there was no prepayment penalty on this. So I was like, all right, this is brilliant. It fits my business model of looking to turn around and sell it pretty quickly. So that, that was good. And thinking back, I didn't get any of the rehab costs um, um, finance, oh. which I wish I got, I took it out of my own money. That was fine. I had that money and it was a safe bet. So I wasn't over leveraging in any way, but at the same time, I could have, you know, probably could have got, I don't know, 70, 75% loan to cost and could have saved so much of the money and used that money to be invested somewhere else. Now it's, I'm going to turn around and use that money. The problem is with that money now kind of is stuck in that deal. Right. So and with a 1031, I'm going to be a little bit rushed. So it's not like I have that freedom with that money to do as I please. It's going to be have to be used for something else, which is fine. But I would have rather have leveraged. The yeah, I think I mean, it's a nice thing is leverage. But four, you know, four percent interest rates, not bad either, though, too. If you went and use other people's money, the interest rate would probably been a little bit higher on that when on the private route versus. So there's always pros and cons to each thing. You know what I mean? So let's talk about the future. Are you still looking to buy more in uh, in, in the Midwest and in, in Ohio and the Cincinnati area? And what are you doing a little bit differently about the funding side? Are you still looking for bank financing or are you looking more on the OPM side of things? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so as, as I've developed and, and kind of, I guess, matured as, a, as an investor and realized as well that, you know, bigger is better. Um, I'm, I'm definitely looking for my own pers personal portfolio in Cincinnati. So I'm looking at 20 to 50 for myself, either as a joint venture as by myself, because um, I, I like the idea of having that little portfolio for myself that brings in the cash flow. But also, I, I've been focusing a lot more on syndications, and I, so I've got partners. I've got three partners now. We're um, four of us in a team, uh, and we're looking at um, bigger deals. We're looking at. We recently made an offer on a 66 unit and a 64 units, and these were in Columbia, South Carolina. Nice places. So yeah. Well, the, the reason we changed Mac is was I like the Carolinas. Um, Good, good market you know there's a lot of jobs a lot of stuff heading that way but also one of the team members is a very strong team and he has a um, you know a good amount of experience he worked for a commercial investor for 15 years now he's doing his own syndications so he's part of his team and he has a good um connection with the brokers there he understands the market he lives in the market himself so when we put the team together we were trying to decide on the market it just made sense to look to look there so that's why we've been looking there so looking at some deals for myself, but mainly been focusing on the syndication route and trying to take down deals. And obviously with syndication, you bring in other people's money. 
um, and have them involved in the deal. So some passive investors. So yeah, re really focused on that and trying to ramp that up here. See, I'd like to do two syndications in 2021. We'll, we'll see how COVID helps us with that or, or not, but that's the goal for sure. Now, are you uh, still, do, still, are you solely focused on multifamily? Are you still looking at single family deals in different markets too or not? Yeah, a little bit. So <laughs> I'm trying to stop myself. I've got definitely got the shiny object syndrome. Massive. Hey, you know today's actual National Squirrel Day, right? <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> squirrel Day. Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that fits in perfectly. Yeah, no, but I fight that. But definitely, definitely trying to keep my focus on multifamily. But um, I, I like the idea of um, some Airbnbs as well. Just a, a little bit of a different model. I have some, um, a couple of. Um, property managers who specialize in Airbnb. So I'm trying to utilize them and trying to leverage them. And I've also got some um, um, agents that I've connected with. So I'm gonna use them. And the cool thing is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, there's a 10% vac vacation home loan that you can get. So you only have to put 10% down. So if it's you know 200 grand home, it's you only have to put 20 ground down to buy that home so it's not you know you know i'm not putting up a lot of capital either for that so the idea with that is that you know i'd like to buy one in florida because uh, that's where i'd like to move back to i think and then another one um, not too far from um where my property is in cincinnati um so just use those it's a great cash flow play you know very little effort on my part just you know find the deal analyze it have the property manager run it, do everything for me. They set up everything for you and just have that little bit of a diverse diversification as well. I'm looking here in Vegas to buy a home for myself. I like that um, owner occupied financing, right? Get in with 5% down, live in it for a year and then do it again. And then, you, you know, in five years time, you have a little small portfolio that was pretty easy. It's a low hanging fruit again. I feel like that's why I like about it, but the, definitely the, I'm trying to keep, I'm trying anyway, but no, I definitely am keeping my focus on multifamily, just doing these little bits on the side that doesn't take up too much of my, of my mind space, I guess. You know, and that, that makes, and you got to take advantage of the opportunities out there too. I mean, I think Vegas is going to get cheap as we get to the, as things kind of start to fizzle out. I mean, it's been one of the hardest hit markets unemployment wise and stuff like that too. And people can't pay or aren't working. They can't pay their mortgage. It's going to lead to an increase in foreclosures in that neck of the woods compared to some other areas. Uh, what part of Florida are you like? You're looking around Tampa again as well? Yeah, or, I'm saying, uh, for, for an Airbnb, I'd like St. Pete Clearwater, you know, something not too far from the beach. That way it'd be just, I don't know, I'd have some pride of ownership or something like that. It'd be cool to own something like that. And I think if you buy it right there, you can definitely make some good money as well. And long term, just only something by the beach that, you know, can't imagine it's going to go down in value. You know what I mean? So well, and, and that's the beautiful thing about Florida. It's got so much stuff on the West Coast. I mean, Indian Rocks Beach has been a great area. Clearwater, that mm -hmm. whole area of Tampa, Bradenton, all that neck of the woods yeah. is doing really well. And we've got a couple of buddies that are doing that here in Texas on the Gulf Coast. Uh, part rentals, apartments, but also uh, uh, they leave a couple of their units and their multifamily available for Airbnb. And um, it was a smart play that they did because it's kind of, it led to people that they had vacant, they had some short-term rentals as people were recovering, getting out of Houston, want to go someplace with their family, a little bit bigger spot away from other people so they can kind of enjoy it a little bit versus being holed up in a smaller place downtown, you know, for the most yeah. part. So. Yeah, yeah. And the cool thing is uh, my wife has a family there. So if we want to go there, we can just go stay there. I don't have to feel like <laughs> I have to go, you know, be, be in with my in-laws, you know what I mean? Like sharing bathrooms and hey, stuff. Like nothing that. wrong with ha having dinner, but you want that alone time from mom or mother-in-law and father-in-law, yeah. don't you? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. So, so definitely. And I love the beach as well. So that's definitely one of my goals is to be like, you know, we, we, we love the Dominican Republic, but I'd love to have a house like you know, ideally right on the beach, you wake up in the morning, go drink your coffee and then just walk out to the water or something. That would be, that's one of my dreams for sure. Um, is, you know. Now I want to ask you a question here and I'm going to preface when you were a young kid getting started or starting to, I, I know wrestling, you know, you, 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 I think you came from a pretty small town. Is yeah, that correct? I, 200 people. Yeah. 200 yeah. people. That's, that's, that's not even a town. That's like a village. You know what I mean? In, in a lot of cases. Yeah. Did you did you have like the posters on the walls of your favorite? Who was your favorite wrestler as a kid? Yeah, well, Hulk Hogan, I would say, was my favorite wrestler as a kid. Okay. But I wasn't a huge wrestling fan, just to okay. be honest. like because just quite simply because growing up we had four TV channels. Growing up, <laughs> that's right. all we had. It wasn't like we were poor. It was just the norm. That's what yeah. everybody had. Around exactly. Yeah. That's what everybody had growing up, and um, they didn't show wrestling on TV. So I barely knew. I kind of knew about it. People had tapes here and there. 
um, but you couldn't really watch it the same level. And, you know, so I didn't really grow up and I really only got into it when I started trying to find what I was going to do in my life, where I was like looking for something in my life. And I just found wrestling because I was big and kind of athletic. And I saw people on TV that kind of looked like me and kind of acted like me. I was like, okay, I think I could do something like that. That's where my real interest peaked. And I, and I then fell in love with it, of course, and fell in love with what I was doing. But um, yeah, and, but I was a Hulk Hogan fan growing up for yeah. sure. Definitely, definitely. Now, the question I'm, uh, the reason I asked that Hulk Hogan fan and probably all those kids, we have posters or other things on the wall, whether it's wrestling or football or, and I used to have Troy Aikman and Emmett Smith from the Dallas Cowboys on my wall, along with Cindy Crawford, who doesn't like Cindy Crawford or anything. <laughs> yeah. But you think about it, we, as we get older and we start visualizing things, I know that your guy is probably very goal oriented and have things. What's on your proverbial poster wall now? You have anybody that you love looking to, towards? You know, I know you talked about Jeff Joe Joe's a great guy. Uh, we've had him on the podcast before, and vice versa. I've been on his, but you know, what's what's on your wall now as an adult kid? Because I don't think we ever grow up. You know, yeah, I mean? that's a good question. Like, who do I look up to essentially? Right, outside of Scott Carson. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm way down the low belt. Okay, <laughs> right, come on now. But yeah, who's who's anybody that you really like to follow or, or really look up to right now? Didn't you know? Didn't have to be a famous name. It could be somebody. Yeah, yeah, else. yeah, 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 yeah. God, that is such a good question. There is, but I can't think off the top of my head. I really, I'd have to look at my uh, podcast. No, I can't think of any really. I, I'm, I'm a huge. I don't know. In the in the real estate world, there's definitely people, but I can't think. I'm sorry, I can't think for now. I'm a huge soccer fan. A huge soccer fan. Okay. Big soccer uh, fan? Yeah, Liverpool. Yeah, definitely all the Liverpool players, but they're, they're doing terrible. Aren't they? Liverpool, I think, is what, in the top two or three right now? And they were, but the last four or five games they've lost, and they've been terrible, so I'm all mad and angry about that right now. So. <laughs> you know, that's one thing with COVID, with Amazon. I've been watching. I like those reality sports shows, and I've learned a lot about soccer because yeah. Austin is actually, we're about to get the Columbus, the Columbus Crews moving to Austin. We're going to be Austin Football Club here. So I've been spending time watching the uh, Amazon special, you know, uh, 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 Tottenham Spurs. Okay, you know, yeah. Uh, more about Liverpool and then all that other good stuff out there. So it's it's very interesting. I'm actually pretty excited about it. And, uh, you know, there's, but I want to come back to this as well, too. Uh, have you, as any of your colleagues or ex-colleagues or friends from wrestling, reached out to you or have you reached out to them and, and right away they, they've looked at you know what you're doing now and and taking any interest into being in real estate as well with you no, no i speak to a few of them and they know what i'm doing i think i think it's early on i think i think as i grow and develop i think there will be and i and i want to build a little bit of a track record before i kind of reach out because wrestlers are very suspicious of other wrestlers <laughs> because from being in the business like you know it's a little bit of a cutthroat business is just how it is right even though you're all working on a team you're essentially looking out for yourself all the time because nobody else is, you know, you're paying your own bills, right? Nobody else is paying your bills for you. So you've always got to take care of yourself. So wrestlers are a little bit suspicious of other wrestlers, to be honest with you. So I think it'll take time to build that trust and that track record before they trust well, me. That uh, makes yeah. that makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot, and we see that in different in areas of real estate too. You know, like wholesalers are very cutthroat business for wholesaling. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of times in different parts of the country too, that you have realtors are very cutthroat or, you know, commercial guys can be cutthroat too. It all depends on find, like you said, find that good person and good people are usually surrounded by good people, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. Like, you know, people hang around with people that are similar to themselves, right? There's no doubt about right that, like that, right? So if someone in that team is a little sneaky and whatnot, you might want to ask, well, you might ask questions about the other members of the team, right? Because we, I think we do, we, we gravitate to pe people similar to ourselves, right? Or that have similar beliefs and have similar values, I think. Yeah. That's that's totally the truth. I think you, you, we surround so we like to surround ourselves with like minded people and, mm -hmm. and going from there and similar mindset. I mean, and that's a, that's what I love about the real estate industry for the most part is usually it's people that are in it for a long run have a whole better developed mindset. They've got a clear picture of what they want to do. They're usually investing in their themselves and finding that I don't know better mindset or getting rid of the. I think we build a little thicker skin because we're used to having good things maybe not always go the right way for us in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think the mindset thing is like, I had somewhat of the mindset stuff before, but nothing like what I've been working on now since being in real estate. That's, that's been a huge thing in real estate for me. If, even if I didn't make another dollar in real estate, that mindset component of, 
understanding you know more about myself and how I work and like just just that that, that the mindset actually exists that there is this thing called the mindset right that the way we think about it the way we talk about stuff the way we talk to ourselves the way we frame stuff all this stuff is I love that stuff it's mind-blowing to me and it's just crazy to me that that exists because I didn't really understand I had goals and visions but that was just from I don't know it wasn't even nobody told me it was just what I had right it's just what I had and, and I had you know ambition and all the, a lot of some other components already but once I realized about that mindset stuff I really like just fell in love with that I was just so fascinated by that I think it's just so interesting because you can change everything by mindset right literally everything you can change it with mindset it's just nuts literally nuts this conversation can be changed by the mindset right oh is that a good conversation or is it a bad conversation well if i say it's a good conversation it was a good conversation right yeah. in my head and that's how you think about it it's just it's just nuts absolutely nuts i, I love that now uh your wife is she very ha she's involved in your real estate business as well or she keeps it separate or how's that kind of dynamic? yeah yeah she's a she's an agent here in vegas she just got a license last year she's a she still got her, um, she's a flight attendant as well. She still has that, but because we have a son and she was able to take some time off with nice. with COVID, she hasn't had to work, I don't know, maybe two years now, but we still have the flight benefits. So that's really nice. Well, that comes <laughs> a nice when you got to jump on a plane, go check out a new market though too, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It just makes traveling places a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, apart from being standby, in terms of cost, it's easy. It's a pain in the backside to be flying standby sometimes, but yeah. But she's an agent here in Vegas. And recently as well, because I'm, you know, I'm all crazy about real estate, right? I'm all about it and talk about it, think about it all day long. I think she, I've managed to persuade her to try and house hack in Florida because she wants to move back to Florida. That's where her family is. So mm -hmm. I said, well, why didn't you start uh, not house hacking, uh, doing the Burr method? Yep. The Burr method in, in there. So I think I've got her on board with that. She's like researching that now, really looking into it. So it's like, if that's where we're going to move back to, why don't you start trying to build a small portfolio of single family homes there? And, you, you know, and she's like, I have no money. Well, like, there's this thing called the Burr, believe it or not. So look into it. So I, hopefully she's going to do that. And she's an agent here now in Las Vegas as well. So it's a bit of a crazy market here right now. But. You know, it totally is a crazy market, man. By your opinion, and you may not know this, how, how would you say, how, how far back is Vegas as far as from, you know, stuff being open or still being closed compared to where it was? Would you say it's like 20%, 30, 50? Where would you say based on what you know in the market? It's got a while to go, I think. I think, you know, it's going to take vaccine being wildly dis distributed. International travel is the big thing for Vegas, massively international travel. There's still people coming here to Vegas, but they're not people spending a lot of money. You know what I mean? They're people flying in on a cheap flight from... Atlanta or Florida or wherever, right? They're coming somewhere on a cheap flight because flights are cheap right now. They're getting a cheap hotel. You know, they you know they're coming here and then they're not going to all the restaurants. They're not they they're not looking to spend every penny they have, right? They're just coming yeah. here because they can just about afford it. They they're enjoying a little bit of gambling and then they're leaving. And then the people from California, there's a lot of people from California that come here for the weekends and stuff. But those people aren't spending either. You know, you come in for the car for a weekend, you're not going crazy, right? You're not putting stuff on the credit card or right. you know, gambling like crazy, going to the shows or whatever, because you can come back next week or next month or whatever. So that international travel is really what's hurting Vegas. I think once that come back, comes back, I think that's the game changer. Now, when will that be? I don't know, because also, we, you know, we, we're not in control that here in the U.S., right? It depends what they, how they vaccinate in other countries, how they feel about it. Like, you know, the, the, talking about mindset, right? That's a huge mindset stuff, right? How, are people comfortable traveling? Do people want to travel? Are they going to be cooped up and desperate to travel and go somewhere and have a great time? I, I don't know. So just to give you an example, in, in our show, we, we won't be back anytime before July with Cirque du Soleil, I don't think. And my show is probably going to be closer to the end of the year, I think. So it just gives you an idea of how, how, how uh, the show is Cirque du Soleil. The show is called Ka, K-A, it's at the MGM Grand. But, with the big moving stage. Yeah, you've seen that show, yeah. I, I've seen it three times, absolutely love it. It's such a unique show and it's everywhere. It's like a 360 degree kind of show with people, you know, sh you know in the audience and hang, coming down from above. It's actually yeah. my favorite Cirque du Soleil, so it's nice. Oh, you had to say that, but thank you. <laughs> I, I don't have to say anything. I'm confident <laughs> enough. <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, it, but going back to the Vegas thing, it's it's interesting because, like you said, the economy is like being hit so hard. Yeah, I don't know what unemployment is and now. Yeah, I think I think it's still about ten percent. I think maybe it's around twelve percent. You know, the national average is what six. So we like nearly still have double the within the national average. Even you know, even if it's ten, right, it's still way higher and it's still very high numbers. 
but home prices here are still skyrocketing. It's just nuts. Like my wife tells me a story all the time. If it's house is decently priced, you're gonna, you know, get cash offers at list price or above. Yeah. So anyone else, they've got to, you've got to come in way above that, you know. And it's just how is this sustainable? Is my question, right? With unemployment like that, right? And it's that it's definitely a story of America as well as the haves and the haves not, right? You know, there's people that the gap is getting wider, I think, right? The wealth gap, as anyone talks about, but, you know, the lower end people, you know, they can't afford, so they're renting. So the rental market is on fire here now. It's just, I don't know. It might continue. You never know, right? I don't want to ever want to say anything because who, who knows what could happen, right? But logically, and logic thinking doesn't always apply to the economy and everything else like that, is that logically, how can this continue, right? You know, I think last year was it 11% appreciation, like year over year that, that home prices went up and, you know, this year started off with a bank. How is that sustainable? I don't know. Low interest rate, keep dropping low interest rates. I don't well, know. Well, and that's the, that's the thing with Biden, right? As we re record this, he just extended the foreclosure and eviction moratorium out there uh, mm -hmm. through the end of March. And the things that I track is the biggest, the hardest hit price point in, in just about every market, when if they have it, is that sub two hundred thousand dollar value asset. You know, and if it's a house below 200, that's usually or 100 in some cases, like the Midwest. And we talk about price disparity between Vegas or uh, Tampa versus Cincinnati or Columbus or Austin. I mean, we don't see that much stuff here. If it is, it's a shack. But I think that's one of the big things you talk about things flying off the shelves. Is you have a lot of California people getting the heck out of Dodge mm -hmm. and Vegas, Phoenix. That's why those markets are on fire because people are overpaying because they, They've got, it's cheaper for what they're buying. They see the bigger bang for the buck than what they're paying for in, in California. You know what I mean? So. There's a lot of California people coming here for yeah. sure. No, you no, can no keep thing. them. You, the, you know, Texas <laughs> leads the nation. California, Air, uh, Vegas, I think is second. Arizona's third. So uh, you feel free to keep them over there. That's totally fine. Uh, yeah, hopefully things uh, they don't bring their legislation. and it's like, you know, right. Communist state of California. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's another, that's another talk for another day, but. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> you know, you and I could talk. We got to get together in some in, in another episode later on. But Barry, what's the best way for our listeners to follow you to see what you're up to and and connect with you to find out more about what you're working on, maybe in, in pitching and uh, be an investor or two for you? Yeah, yeah. Thank well, thank you for having me on the show, man. It's always a good time talking to you, man. It's very easy to talk to you and a lot of fun, and uh, I always enjoy that. Uh, so thanks for having me on. But yeah, if, if people want to reach out, I have my own podcast, um, really daily shows, as crazy as that seems, and it is crazy. But I love it. I love talking to people, and I love love doing the show. So I have a daily podcast called the WWRE Podcast, which stands for Wrestling with Real Estate Podcast. But the best place is if you go to wrestlingwithrealestate.com, um, all the podcasts, my YouTube um you know um some free free stuff on there if you guys want to know more about multifamily and if you guys want to reach out and jump on a call with me or anything just talk about anything whatsoever rest, rest, uh, real estate related well you can talk about wrestling as well if you want but there's going to be a link in that page as well so wrestling with real awesome we'll have the links in the uh, show notes below as well uh whether you're listening to this or watching it uh, barry man thanks so much for coming on man thanks for having me on your show a while back as well too uh it's a pleasure to meet you. It's amazing. We reached out and talked to each other on Instagram to begin with. I love what you were doing. I was like, hey, yeah, I got to have you on mine. Let's do a swap. And it's it's been a great conversation, man. And then look forward to hanging with you. We got to get together some point, uh, whether I come to Vegas or you're out in, in Florida, because we spend a lot of time out in Florida, too. Or if you ever come to Austin, you got to give me a holler, man. All right. Or oh, even better, Dominican Republic. And then we, you know what? I think <laughs> we need to do that. We need to get a bunch, of our, a bunch of our buddies, figure yeah. out a resort there, fly to the Dominican. Yeah. On-site COVID test come on, make sure we're all good. We fly back in, but that'd be a lot, a lot of fun. A bunch of us having out there, right? Yeah. If anyone wants to be part of a mastermind in the Dominican Republic, reach out to us. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. All right, everybody. Hey, that's gonna wrap it up for this episode of the Note Closure Show. Uh, one of the biggest things I think you want to take in mind there is, look, we all have a plan. A. We all have goals of what we want to accomplish and achieve in lives. And you know what? God, we plan. God, man plans, and God laughs a lot of time. And it's always good to have that plan B, be something different than we're doing. I think Barry shared a great insight and in how we all go through that kind of licking our wounds as we get kicked in the teeth or kicked in the huevos. But you know, you can if you want to accomplish something, there's enough people out there finding a good team, finding people that you can network, surround yourself with, whether it's local or in a new market. The beautiful thing about 2021, hey, it's a new age, and you're just a phone call, an email, or one degree away from. Uh, somebody in a different market helping you out and, and find some amazing deals. So go out there, whether it's in traditional real estate notes, whatever it might be, go out, take some action, work toward your goals, 
you know, success doesn't happen overnight, but if you keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, you'll be very surprised where you are just a, a short period of time. So go out, take some action, buddy. And uh, we'll see you all at the top, everybody. Bye.